backwards. As every opponent was carefully selected as to be not dangerous, but in sufficiently uh, capable to bring Mike a little further along. Our picking was very, very well done. Some people felt that we were bringing Mike along too quickly. Other people felt that we were bringing Mike along too slowly. But Mike was brought along exactly right. That's it. Very good, very good. Jimmy and Bill Caton knew what they were doing with Mike Tyson. And if they said, Kevin Rooney is your man, he's going to train you, there were no more questions. And Kevin Rooney and Tyson had this closeness because of that closeness Tyson had with Custom Motto. But whatever they were doing, it worked. And Kevin Rooney was all of a sudden looking like the greatest trainer who has ever come into the sport of boxing. You honestly believe now you're going to be the heavyweight champ, don't you? Most definitely. Like, I know um, Tuesday follow Monday. This is the main event of the night. 12 rounds of boxing for the WPC Championship of the World. Burbick just trying to get through the round. He's it was an electrifying experience because one felt that here is some sort of primeval force coming in in his black trunks and no socks. And Trevor Burbick is the older man who's just arrogant. The boxer must feel himself in some strange way an extension of the nerve fibers of the crowd because the boxer is acting out suppressed or denied aggressions in, in the civilization. So he sort of rises to this peak of adrenaline, you know. But it's not that he's alone in doing that. The, the crowd is urging him on. So the whole thing is a strange exercise in complicity, which people don't like to talk about. Has a right to the body and an uppercut He's to the head, and Burbick is down. This one is going to be over, I believe. It's over. That's all, and we have a new era in boxing. I'd like to dedicate my fight to my great guardian, Custom Auto. And I'm, I'm sure he's up there and he's looking and he's talking to all the great fighters and saying his boy did it. And smiling, that's right. Mike Tyson, yeah! This countryman, he's never lost a fight. Now, Greg Haugen would like him to hear something he's never heard before. Adios, Julio. Chavez versus Haugen, the grand slam of boxing. Coming soon. Call your cable company. I just remember going back to the room and Mike having this belt and just staring at this green belt. And he just went up into the mirror and he was holding it up like this and just staring in the mirror and, and truly not believing that this was his or that this was him. I remember this girl walking up to him like, Mike Tyson, Mike Tyson. And he was like shocked. Wow, they know me. And I'm like, Mike, people know you. Oh, my goodness. I saw you on TV the other night. Please welcome Mike Tyson. Is this the championship belt, or is that your watch? No, I... You know the bracelet? For a big, powerful, strong guy, you got such a sensitive, sweet voice. Thank you. It doesn't, it doesn't fit your price value. The press jumped all over. Not that they were trying to take advantage of him, but they had a hero on their hands. And they wanted to speak to this hero. And they wanted to find out what made him tick. Are the people here doing it because you like me or because I make a lot of cash? Mike came to my house one summer, and he sat down and he signed my kids pictures and we kind of talked we wanted to know how does it feel the fast life and this new found stardom we had the feeling that he didn't he didn't really like you know the publicity the cameras and everything personally you know i'm one that really don't care much about being in front of the television or anything like that i'm just the kind of person i get the biggest satisfaction from giving 
are safe and not. We're supposed to save the people that need help. We're supposed to have a, a lending hand. Drop them. Put them down for the count. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to snap some jammies, man. All of Brooklyn loves Mike because Mike came from the streets, and a lot of people that's in the streets look up to that, and, and, and they feel that, OK, if this brother can do it, get out of here, I can get out of here, too, and make it better for myself. Thank you, hon. Can I have a kid? Nah. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Las Vegas Hilton Sports Arena, where tonight, Don King Productions presents the hard road to glory. Every fighter that we fought in the HBO tournament was a Don King promoted, managed fighter. So once we wiped them all out, Don King had nothing. He had no more fighters. We beat all his guys. He had nothing. So what Don King just said, well, I got nothing. I got to have, I got, I, I'll steal the champ. Don King is a gangster from Cleveland. He, uh, he murdered two people when he was running the numbers in Cleveland. One was ruled justifiable homicide. The other he did three years and 11 months in prison for. He came out of prison in 71 and began to get involved in boxing. And by 76, 77, he was emerging as the dominant figure in boxing. Now, I am an extraordinary hustler. So therefore, I feel that I am likened to only two or three giant promoters in the lifetime that we have lived in, and that's P.T. Barnum and Michael Todd and yours truly. He uh, reverted back to his hustler gangster roots in Cleveland and started to rob and cheat his fighters to the point where six former heavyweight champions and 25 different fighters have sued King because King robbed them of their money. If he cheated me out of a million dollars and I made two million dollars, I'd be happy. Because <laughs> cause when I was fighting, you couldn't make over, if you made a couple hundred thousand dollars, you were a lucky guy. I mean, I never made that kind of money. I never made over $15,000 in my whole fight career. I revolutionized the pay scale in boxing. I made more millionaires than boxing than all the rest of my competitors collectively. I mean, and I put on better bouts, better competitive bouts. So why do I always be singled out? You know what I mean? To be the one that they're going to go out and target to go do whatever they want to do with. You know what I mean? So I feel that in America, and I will not refuse nor reject America. I say I'm the only in America man. And I stay on that criteria because this is the greatest country in the world. And because I believe in this country, I'm going to continue to fight for this country. They're extolling the virtues of this country, decrying his iniquities and injustices. And I was, I was hitting him with body punching. I heard him actually he was crying in there, making woman gestures like, oh, 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 I can't How, find him. But I knew that he was breaking down soon. You're saying that Biggs was crying when yes, you hit him? Yes. What more pejorative comment could a, could a boxer make about another? He, he would shriek like a woman, as if Tyson knew what a woman was like when she was hit, which maybe he did. I just see a, a guy that with class in there tonight. I seen a guy that throws elbows. I seen a guy that throws butts. I seen a guy that hits after the bell. I seen all of this in Mike Tyson. I didn't see a gentleman in there. If they want to make him out of a beast that he claimed to be, he's going to be in there with a beast. Ladies and gentlemen, the man known as the Eastern Assassin, former heavyweight champion of the world, Larry Ho! The last friendly, warm and friendly meeting I had with Mike was after the Holmes fight. For the Holmes fight, Mike was going with three girls, which seemed to be semi-serious about three women. This was Miss America, Robin, and a very gorgeous model. We put one in one section, one in the second section, one in the third section, completely separated. And he sat here, and we talked about it, and we laughed about it. And so when he left, uh, I started to say, where are you going now, Mike? He said, I'm going to the coast. Those were the last things he said to me prior to is being married to Robin. <laughs> Robin, uh, inquiring minds want to know, how does a woman who went to Sarah Lawrence and Harvard Medical School wind up falling in love with a guy who's a graduate of the School of Hard Knocks? God, I want to know, too. There's something, we have a lot of, in common, uh, tradition, traditional families, and, and we just sort of love each other. We sort of love at first sight. It was hard in the beginning, but we got through it, and we ended up married. Well, just three weeks after the marriage, I got a call from Robin. I am Mrs. Mike Tyson, and I'm taking over. I demand this, and I demand this. I said, wait a minute. 
we welcome you back to, to Live at Five, Thank Robin. You. The Sports Illustrated article and some of the others, the tone is that suggests that you and your mother are opportunists and that you are meddling too much in Mike's career. Right. Um, that's absurd. <laughs> First of all, Michael's wife. And not only that, but we're family. I mean, my mother has become Michael's mother. Um, an incident happened and we noticed a discrepancy with Michael's money. That's what sort of opened up everything. If Michael has $50 million and he's supposed to have $70 million, there's a problem. In a way, Robin and Ruth were like a football team. They, you know, the mother-in-law had a game plan. And the game plan was to get Mike Tyson on the field, march the ball up the field, score the touchdown, end of game, they march away with the ball and the money and uh, fame and fortune and all that. Don King looked on Mike Tyson's marriage as his opportunity, giving him advice and counsel on how to take Mike over and how to make problems of various kinds for me. But the women, being shrewd and greedy and smart on the one side, the criminal smartness, they said to themselves, Screw Don King, we don't need him. We don't need, you know, we're gonna have him, he's gonna take all money. We don't need him, we're gonna take all the money we can get now. From Cincinnati, Ohio, he is the second ranked heavyweight in the world and a former heavyweight champion, ladies and gentlemen, the challenger, Tony TNT Cole. My, my mission is to go and destroy and not to let anything get involved. You get punched, you get hurt, I refuse to be hurt, knocked down and knocked out. I can't lose, I refuse to lose. You saw behind Mike's shoulder there his co-manager, Bill Caton. For the first time since Mike's been fighting as a professional, the other co-manager, Jim Jacobs, has not been able to make this trip. Funeral services were held in Hillside Memorial Cemetery for boxing manager Jimmy Jacobs, who died Wednesday. Heavyweight champion Mike Tyson, Jim Jacobs co -manager. Mike was at Jimmy Jacobs' funeral. There were shouting matches with people from Merle Lynch over trust funds that Mike had put away. The mother and Robin Gibbons herself were up at offices of an investment firm trying, screaming desperately to get the money. You have poor Cuss and poor Jimmy gone, rest their souls. All these forces struggling for the soul of Mike Tyson. Now we have Don King at the gate. This is a man who does not discourage easily. And I try to tell Jim and Bill, King said to me, he was going to take your fight. I'm trying to tell you, he's, ah, he won't take it. Jim Jacobs and Bill King, oh, no, we're two, blah, 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 blah. Hey, where did he end up? I tried to tell you, but, hey, that's business. Now he's getting ready to fight Michael Spinks. The fight is in Atlantic City. They managed to get through the training period during the week. But on the weekends, Ruth Roper and Robin Gibbons would come down to Atlantic City to lend their particular brand of charm to, to this already inflammatory situation. Uh, and Trump was, was romancing that. I happen to know Robin Givens Tyson. She is one hell of a fine lady. And Caitlin was trying to be there and try to, trying to prove to the world that Mike Tyson loved him, which he didn't. Um, and it, it was just a, a constant emotional drain on everybody involved. So I come down there, and um, he says, we could talk upstairs. So to break the ice, I said, yeah, you know, where do you run in the mornings? I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to start an interview. And he said to me, I went on a boardwalk. And I said, great. I said, what do you think about it? He said, I think about Cuss. And some of the things he told me. And how right he was about some things. And how he's not here anymore to help me. And then I begin to think about different things. And he said, and, I, and it occurs to me how much more fun it used to be. I mean, it wasn't about money then so much. We were all like a family. We were together. But then suddenly everything, he said, he said, they died, and, and, and meaning Cuss and Jimmy, he said, and everything became money, money, money. And he said, now it's like I don't have anybody to talk to. Now, this is a newlywed saying this. And he leans forward, and he grabs me, and he's got his head against my chest. And he is clearly going through absolute total hysteria and the water is flowing so much to the point that when the interview was over i had to go back upstairs and change my shirt my dad was uh, 18 when he started selling it's an atlantic city express souvenir get it now get it hot news and more 35 cents and now ladies and gentlemen once and for all let's get ready to rumble 12 rounds for the undisputed heavyweight 
championship of the world. Hey, you want my prediction? Yeah. I think a black guy's gonna win. Yeah, I'm picking Michael Spinks in the 10th round. I definitely picked the guy with the short pants. It's Spinks and Tyson, it's on. The world is waiting for this fight. So you go to each other's dressing room to check the wraps and the gloves and so forth. I walk down, you know, I always try to get an edge where I can when, I, when uh, my guy's getting ready. But I go in and I think I'm gonna rattle the kid because he's under a lot of pressure. At the time, uh, uh, Jacobs uh, uh, had passed. Jim Jacobs, the closest guy to him, had died right on the verge of this happening. He was in the, the mix with Robin Givens. Don King is trying to pull him away from Caton. So I'm in the dressing room with Tyson, and I'm looking to rattle this guy. I walk in, and he's punching, standing there. He and Rooney, Rooney's putting something on. He's punching holes in the wall. I'm like to myself, oh, no. This guy's getting ready to fight my guy, my little guy. And he's punching holes in the wall before he goes out to fight? Oh, no. That night, Mike Tyson knew that his whole life had built to this moment. He had been groomed like a gladiator. He was so tuned to that fight because he felt that unless he performed in that ring, then nobody would accept him outside of the ring. That Tyson that we met that night, no other boxer professionally or as an amateur has seen that Mike Tyson other than Mike. Mike Tyson was at the best he could be that night. Now watch Tyson jump right into his chest. When Tyson fought Sphinx, Tyson's purse was somewhere in the neighborhood. $22 million. The fight, of course, only lasted barely a minute and a half, 91 seconds. You divide that up and you see Mike Tyson earned almost a quarter of a million dollars a second for that fight. And Spinks didn't do too badly either. He earned about $150,000 a second uh, because he made about $13 million for the fight. Tyson not afraid, as we expected, and Spinks ready to mix it up with him. Tyson along the ropes doing damage. Michael Spinks has to keep moving because every shot... Oh, Uppercut landed inside and Spinks went down. Oh. It was the left uppercut. I was surprised there was a body shot that put him to the canvas. And that is the first time Michael Spinks has ever been down in a professional fight. And he's down again and in serious trouble. A right hand right on the chin. He's not going to make it. It's all over. We did it! When Mike Tyson isn't earning $15 million in 91 seconds and Robin Givens isn't starring in television's head of the class, now they live as just an average couple of newlyweds on their $4.5 million New Jersey estate. He's very romantic. He's very, you know, slip a diamond under your pillow or, or, you know, you say, bring me something back and you mean like, I mean anything and comes back with a Porsche. I mean, things like that. That's just Michael. From the standpoint of Mike Tyson, she was like a fairy princess, actually. And what happened after the marriage, Mike became thoroughly and completely obsessed with her. It's an obsession that I have never seen in any man before to a woman. Very much in love. You were so in love with her that just sometimes you could see her in his face was the pain there. After the Sphinx fight, there was the stormy summer of 88, the broken hand against Mitch Green, the affairs in Moscow at the hotels with ranting in the lobbies, the crack up of the car in Catskill, all because Robin is driving Mike crazy. Michael is a manic depressive. He is. I mean, that's just a fact. It's been torture. <laughs> it's been pure hell. It's been worse than anything I could possibly imagine. I think for the first time I can understand abused women. There's a time when he cannot control his temper, and that's frightening to me or to my mother. Um, I don't know what Mike Tyson would be without 
my mother, what we would be. I mean, she's been the glue that's kept us together. If I was Mike, I would just give her something. I don't know. I would give this, stuck my hands in her mouth or what. Gibbons called police to the Bernardsville house this weekend, claiming the champ was tearing up the house and threatening her and her mother. If she wants it right now, take me. She can leave right now. Take everything I have and just leave. Love can be fleeting. The soap opera marriage of boxing champ Mike Tyson and actress Robin Gibbons is coming to an end. She announced today through her lawyer that she's seeking a divorce after eight months together. Robin Gibbons was the jab that set Mike up for the Don King right hand. I think by the fall of 1988, Mike's life is in shambles, and Don King moved in. Don King is my man. He's the best at what he does. So suddenly there's a whole new cast of characters around Mike. And I think that Kevin Rooney didn't fit into the picture. He got involved in the fighter's personal life. Uh, Tyson didn't like that. He probably also had Don King whispering in his ear about maybe he'd be better off with new people around him. And he fired Kevin Rooney. My, my philosophy was like people basically suck. Because really, you know I mean, they're still always trying to screw you. Everyone? No, not, you know, you run into, you, you have, um, it's different occasions where you run into nice people, you know what I mean? But, you know I mean, you've been to experience, you know. Um, they, they really, they don't have no um, emotion towards um, human feelings, you know what I mean? Hard to trust. Absolutely. Mike Tyson is the most famous athlete in the world. Fame has even followed Tyson across the sea to Japan. His Tyson's in Japan to defend his heavyweight boxing title against James Buster Douglas. But win or lose that match, Tyson will leave Tokyo millions of dollars richer. They assemble a corner for that fight, which looks like it was picked up out of the semifinals of the inner city Golden Gloves. Tyson felt he had nothing to be concerned about with Douglas. He obviously did not train. He had, he had a lot of problems as far as paying attention to business. This is a kid who virtually lived in the gym in the Catskills. Now, I don't want to train today. Well, you know, who's going to tell him? You know, I started hearing him start saying different things. I'm the baddest man on this planet. No one can be on this planet. You never know what's going to happen. It's great to have confidence in yourself, but don't get overconfident. Please welcome the challenger, James Buster Douglas. As a fighter, Mike Tyson was much more than a bully. He was a fine fighter, but he had reached a stage in Tokyo where all that was left was the bravado and, and, and the aura of a bully. Mike says, all right, now I'm a man. Now I'm on my own. He's taking the macho thing. I can handle it. And if I let my guard down, I go to somebody and say, hey, I need help. I can't handle this. I know how to fight. I don't know how to handle all this other stuff that goes with it. But then who does he go to to say that he can trust that person? He doesn't know. So he has to kind of wing it. And he starts to kind of get out of sync because it's not the guy there that says, back on track, Mike. Oh back on track. Mike, stop. That's no good. You shouldn't do that. That's the wrong thing to do. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. That was gone out of his life. And this kid had to start to fend, start to try to trust people he didn't know, deal with things he didn't ever have to deal with before. And he's just a kid. He shouldn't have to. He's a boxer. Introducing the undefeated, undisputed, heavyweight champion of the world, the one and only Iron Mike Tyson! It wasn't Mike who was there. It wasn't him. He didn't look right. He looked like he was in a daze. And he didn't fight when he got there. Tokyo. Well, it's a bad situation at the time, but I'll be okay. Buster Douglas fought a great fight, and I'll be champion again within six months. Buster Douglas is ill beating Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. You know, that's like a, a Volkswagen knocking off a Mercedes, if you know what I mean, in a race. Mm -hmm. You just don't think things like that again. I know, but you know, he's, like I said before, you know, I abused myself, abused my body, and like when you reach a status that 
you know I mean, young age, you know what I mean, like being 20, 19, even though I wasn't the champion at 19, 19, you know what I mean, I was proclaimed, and you know, I was, I was wealthy, and I was, I was, and it was, it was a little too much, you know, I, mean? I don't want to, you know, use excuses, you know, and being 20 years old, being channeled, you, you're, you're really too young. Long before Mike was in any trouble, a guy named Tim Layden, who was a, a, not a sports reporter, but a police beat reporter up at the Albany Times Union, and um, he said to me, quote, Mike's biggest problem far and away is women. That's the problem that's going to wind up nailing him someday. Joe Mahoney, another reporter, just said, absolutely, women are Mike Tyson's, quote, Achilles heel. So, I mean, and this is four years before the Desiree Washington thing. I mean, you got 200 girls that are trying to give you a phone number a day. About 15, 20, 200. When I worked for him in a, in a China club, the biggest thing was actually keeping the girls away. I was like, white girls, Spanish girls, Chinese, you know, Asian, uh, they're all over them, all over them. When we had him in our offices for a, a conference with Don King, and we're on the 20, on the seventh floor of a building that's 28 stories high, a state office building. Everybody in this building knew he was here. They came down from upstairs, they came up from downstairs by the hundreds. They came off the street to see Mike Tyson who was sitting on the floor. And I was standing there watching as he sat on the floor signing autographs, many times running his hand right up the leg of a woman he never met in his life. Some of them loved it and let him get away with it. Some of them pulled back. One of them even cracked him on the top of the head, took the autograph and ripped it up. The world has this, this impression of us as, uh, here's a guy who goes around f um, grabbing people and stuff like that, and that's not true. First of all, for me to grab you, you have to be within my reach. So that says a lot. I can't grab you from across the street. I can't grab you from the distance. Um, you know, his, his, your arm is only so many inches long. First time I met him was quite a distressing circumstance. I was at Gleason's gym. He was talking with a group of people, and I came over and said that I'm a reporter with El Diario La Prensa. You know, could you spare a few minutes? Um, and he, he made some very odd sexual references in Spanish and started doing this uh, odd sort of salsa in front of me, like sticking his arms out and waving them. And I knew those words were from the gutter. You, know, you don't have to know Spanish to know what the meaning was. And at that point, um, he reached out and he grabbed my breast. And I was shocked. I was stunned. I, I, didn't know, I didn't know what to do. So I hit him. Anytime you bring Mike Tyson up, people would talk about the past, or Robin Givens, or unbeaten women, or grabbing women. Who is he to grab girls' butts? Girls want their butts grabbed, all right? People like excitement. Mike Tyson was excitement. When I found out that he was staying at the hotel, and before the fight, I called him up and I said something like really stupid. Um, I, I called him, I was like, hi, Mike. You know, I think you're great, you're awesome. You know, you're my fantasy. You know, you, you, you have a perfect body, you're great. He sees a woman coming at him, maybe after he's been drinking, uh, he's been celebrating, she's happy, she grabs him and hugs him and says, oh, you're great and you're, you're my hero and I'm so happy to be near you. She may just mean that. Not all women who throw themselves at athletes in the interest of developing a friendship want to be sexual with them. If you meet him at a club and say, hey, baby, you know, you look great, I want to be with you, I don't think Mike thinks you want to, you know, have a picnic at Central Park and play Monopoly. When a woman is handing you her underwear to give to my boss, I kind of gather what she wants to do. Uh, they don't want to talk about boxing, that's for sure. So uh, we basically knew what they wanted and how fast and how long they had. Um, you know, s some of the stuff went on in airplanes in between cities. You know, there's always a bathroom on an airplane. You know, you, you had a few that we had to get rid of, that I had to get rid of with money, because it's very hard at 3 o'clock in the morning um, in, in Los Angeles, in a limousine, when a, when a girl just finished having sex with him for two hours, now she doesn't want to get out the car, and she's telling me that, well, she's not going anywhere. So now if I put my hands on her, it becomes a, uh, it becomes a police matter. There was a point, you know, when behind closed doors, he, you know, he did get rough, and it was clear that's what he liked. Um, 
I don't think he thought he was being rough. I just thought that's the kind of sex he likes. So, you know, I, I don't know, it was a man thing where if I give it to you, you're gonna like it. I was looking at something, but I heard him close the door. And I turned around, you know, I, I heard this lock, you know, I'm like, this doesn't sound good. <laughs> and as soon as I turned around, I mean, he just came at me. It was horrible. At one point, I was on my stomach, and he had my hand back like this.